This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and a very special welcome to two members of the Senate of Virginia, Amanda Chase from Chesterfield, who became a senator in 2016, Correct. and Senator Jennifer McClellan, who served a little over a decade in the House of Delegates, and then a senator in 2017. Yes. So we're delighted to have the two of you here to talk about election past and about upcoming session of the General Assembly. So why don't we start with the election? Amanda, since you have one more year in the Senate, we'll start with you, even though <laughs> Je Jennifer has sure. the, the House seniority. And then the two of you to talk about the election, some of your perspectives, any any surprises or anything you want to say? No surprises at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, um, I don't think anyone was predicting the, the massive turnout where we would potentially lose 15 House members. So, um, you know, I think the most people thought we could lose on a good day would probably be eight members in the House, but it was definitely a tsunami. Mm -hmm. So a lot of surprises there, and um, I remember being at an event that night, and, um, you know, we were waiting for the results to come in, and someone pulled me aside, and we were very closely watching um, Delegate Roxanne Robinson's race. Um, she's in my district, as well as Delegate Manoli Lupasi, and Delegate Riley Ingram, those were the ones that quickly came to my attention, probably around 8.30, that um, things were not looking so well um, for, for them. But um, thankfully, uh, two of the three were able to pull it out within a very close margin. Um, you know, unfortunately, not every everyone's gonna be coming back. We're gonna miss Delegate Lupasi coming back. But of, of in my district, I had five members in the House, and three had very very tight races, so we're, we, are, we are very surprised. I think the biggest surprise was the result in Chesterfield County, and um, I remember as we were watching the results, um, and I guess on election night, uh, Ralph Northam uh, had narrowly lost Chesterfield, but it was by less than a thousand votes, and when I saw that, I thought, you know, we're not only are we going to win, we're going to win big, and I think my, my prediction before had been uh, Northam by three. I, I knew we were going to win, uh, you know, Justin Fairfax and, and Mark Herring. I thought maybe 10 House seats. Um, but once those Chesterfield results came back, uh, we knew we were definitely watching a tsunami. I actually wasn't surprised by the turnout for two reasons. Um, you remember I announced for the Senate, the de you know, the Monday after Election Day last year, and there were a lot of new newly engaged, particularly but not exclusively women, who had never been involved in politics before, who came out to knock on doors in my special election. And they weren't just from my district, they were from all over the Richmond region. Um, there were new groups formed, uh, Indivisible, Together We Will, that, that were very engaged. And that engagement was sustained through, uh, you know, through Election Day. And so between that and the turnout for the primaries was a record turnout. And so um, I knew we were in for a, a large turnout. Uh, I did think the election would be closer than it was. And I think um, you know, everybody was surprised at the number of pickups in, in the House. Um, but 
but it was it was very interesting to watch. You know, some have referred to it, and, and these have been males who've done it instead of women necessarily. That it was almost the year of the woman, is in the, in the races in yes. Virginia. It didn't happen in the statewide race for lieutenant governor, but but in the House of Delegate races, it was with a record number of 53 women running, and then over half of them being elected. It, it was. Uh, you you had the experience <laughs> of that in, in 2000. 15 election. Right, you know, and it's interesting in, in what Senator McClellan said. I kind of echo, we, the Republicans saw this in 2009 after President Barack Obama was elected. Mm -hmm. I was a product of that. I, prior to that, was not, you know, and I would vote on election day, but I was not engaged in party politics at all. Um, I was busy um, running a business and raising a family, and this was not on my bucket list, but mm -hmm. it was during that presidential election that, you know, we woke up, like many, I think, on the Democratic side, when, when President Trump um, brought a lot of emotion on, on both sides of the party, especially on the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. It energized the Democratic voters who maybe never would have run for office before to get engaged, um, as it did for me. I mean, that's what happened. And, and I would say that men are encouraging women to, to run for office. And the women are getting behind them because they feel, I think, for, for many years that we were not represented by our legislature. And, you know, when you're making decisions about all Virginians, then we, we should all be represented. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to see that men and women are supporting women candidates in, in this day and time. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts about uh, the, the record number of, of women? I, I think it's significant that it's not just a record number of women, but a record number of women with children and small children. Um, the, the typical tra trajectory of women getting into politics was after they had kids, after they had their career, they usually first got involved through their kids, either running for school board. Um, but, but most of the women that, that ran, I'd say through the early 2000s, that was their path. Um, I was one of the first who actually did it backwards. I ran for office, then got married, then had kids. And now you see a lot of the, the, the new women that got elected. You know, you have Jennifer Floyd Carroll, who just had twins while she was running for office. Um, so now, I think right now there are only two of us uh, La Charisse Aird and I that have kids under 10, uh, now that number has really grown and it shows you don't have to wait, you can do it. Um, and, and women with small children have a very different perspective uh, than men with, a, with small children or with women whose children are already uh, out of the nest, so to speak. So uh, lots of exciting perspectives coming uh, in January. It, it certainly will be. The Senate remains as it is. You had no changes in the Senate, so the Senate r remains the same 20 of you serving. Uh, if our viewers outside of the region seeing the program that haven't paid attention and, and don't know either of you, one's a Republican, one's a Democrat, mm -hmm. but, but people who work together on lots of issues mm -hmm. and then agree to disagree on others. Mm -hmm. So let's maybe move into thinking about the upcoming session and some issues. There may be some that, that you want to talk about that you agree with each other on and some that you have different perspectives on. So Jennifer, why don't you start on this then? What? Well, I think uh, the exit polls show that the number one issue for a lot of people is health care. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to come out of Washington on health care, and I think um, on both sides of the aisle, we are very concerned about what may come from Washington and what that will mean for the state. And I think there is generally bipartisan support for the, um, the making sure that our health care safety net is strong. But the, the issue that we're definitely going to spend a lot of time on is Medicaid expansion. Um, and and it, I have heard some rumblings that there is a little more bipartisan support for that now in the House. We'll see. Uh, but that'll definitely be an issue, um, health care in general, access to, to health insurance um, in general. And then, of course, the number one issue will be the budget. Uh, and mm -hmm. and um, hopefully we will have one on time this year. Yes. 
And I would, I would agree with that. I think health care constituents that were coming to the polls on election day, and I was there for nine hours mm -hmm. <laughs> talking to people and um, asking them, you know, what brought you out today? Health care is the number one mm -hmm. issue that people, that's on their minds, and it is bipartisan. Mm -hmm. And um, whether you're Republican or Democrat, we, you know, my neighbor that lives behind me um, has a son with special needs and, um, you know, was denied the waiver this year. So whenever you're sitting there with constituents that come into your office and you see legitimate needs that are going unmet, as a mom, we are concerned, mm -hmm. um, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. I think the question is how do you address those real needs? And um, you know, I've never been one to support mandates. Um, I don't think we should force people to buy insurance. And I think that's where the Republicans get heartburn is if, if we're mandating people to buy insurance you know, that's probably not going to be an option on the table for us. Um, when we see businesses that are struggling because they were forced to buy um, insurance, what I would like to see is more um, transparency. I'll be putting in a bill, and I'd love to have your support on it, by the <laughs> way, um, that once again, in line with the whole transparency, have a health care cost transparency bill. Um, I remember when Optima and Anthem were pulling out of the individual markets under Obamacare, and the concern was was this, you know, what's going to happen at the federal level? Are we still going to get those federal subsidies from the federal government so that we, the insurance companies, are not bearing the you know the 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 whole liability associated um, with that particular issue? Who's going to who's going to pay for it? Is basically what it comes down to. And so we need to have those discussions. Who, who, needs, who needs the help and who doesn't? Um, I don't think we should be forcing people to buy insurance. And I think the reason that Obamacare um, imploded, if you will, is because you had healthy young people who were not buying the insurance. And so you basically had a pool of unhealthy people that were buying the insurance and they all needed it. And so that model is unsustainable in a free market situation and so you know that's my big concern i have heard at the national level we've heard a number of different things but i've, I've heard talk about block grants from the federal government down to the state government uh, one thing that i would say that's very different from the federal government is that we by law in virginia have to balance our budget that's there are no ifs ands and buts about it so if we just say if we did expand Medicaid, then you're going to have to say, where are you going to cut? What, what service are you going to cut? Are you going to cut education? Are you going to cut transportation? I mean, we're going to have to make some really hard decisions, and, um, you know, they're not going to be easy no matter how you slice them. And the question is, you know, how do you, you know, how do you expand that? If, you know, we had Medicaid um, that was at 1.2 percent of our budget, it's now at 22 percent of our budget. So how much more are we going to increase our budget to 50% and then what's going to be cut? That's my big concern. And if you cut, where are you going to increase? You know, I'm not a huge propo proponent of raising taxes. That's something that um, I think we should stay away from because we, you know, I, I grew up in Chesterfield. I know um, Senator McClellan did as well. We want to make sure that it's still affordable for people to live in Virginia. We have a lot of people that are leaving the state of Virginia, and we have to keep it affordable. So we have a lot of different variables that, that we have to look at. But I look forward to the healthy dialogue, and I just want to you know, assure people that, that we will work together. One thing I love about the Senate is that we, we can, in a healthy way, discuss these issues without all the emotion. And um, you know, we, we really do try to talk through the facts and the numbers and, and try to come up with you know, real solutions for people. So I'm hoping we get behind this health care transparency bill that will hopefully expose uh, what many doctors have been telling us for a long time, and that's that the insurance companies are dictating to the doctors what they can and cannot pay for. Um, I know whenever I've gone to the doctor before, I'll get a, a, a sheet that says, okay, you're going to pay for anything that the health care companies don't pay for, and you don't know what that number is. And so this bill would put a, a real number to that and would allow doctors to deal directly with the patients and not have to worry about that insurance piece and hopefully create some exposure and some transparency as to what those costs are so we can begin at least addressing those. 
So I, I just uh, remind everyone that you know part of the healthcare, um, I mean the Medicaid expansion. I mean it was fully paid for by the federal government, and our taxpayer dollars that Virginians pay went to expand Medicaid in other states, including some Republican-run states. Um, the other failure we had was we had an opportunity to have our own exchange where we, Virginia legislature, and our regulators would govern what would happen in that exchange, and we failed to do that. Um, and so we've missed some opportunities already. Uh, the money we would have gotten from the federal government would have allowed us to, to free up some of our general fund that was currently being used on, on Medicaid. My concern about the block grants is the proposals that I've heard, the block grants would be based on your Medicaid spending now. And Virginia has one of the stingiest Medicaid programs in the country. Um, and even um, you know our, our Republican chairs of our money committees, Chris Jones and Emmett Hanger, recognize that if the federal government does do a block grant based on past spending, we're going to be in trouble. The other big issue is Virginia runs out of money for CHIP in January, the Children's Health Care and Health Insurance Program. Um, that's going to be a significant problem if, if, if uh, the federal government does not reauthorize CHIP. We are going to have to pick that cost up at the state. And so I think people are starting to recognize, and I think this is why so many people came out in this election, how the federal government and the state government on many issues that affect them are inextricably linked. And that if you're concerned about what's happening in Washington, then you have to be concerned about who is in state government and frankly, who's in local government. And I think that was the biggest lesson that came out of this campaign and, and this election. And I hope that that lesson sticks and people will remember that next year uh, and in 2019, uh, that you, you really need to be concerned about who is representing you at every level of government, regardless of the issue that you care about. You know, it's interesting on the health care part to me, the exit polling, I mean, if, if exit polling is somewhat reliable, that health care was the number one issue. I have not yet seen any data from that exit polling to know how many Republicans said that it's a top issue, how many Democrats said that it's a top issue, because even as the two of you have discussed it with different perspectives, it's not like all 40 percent think the way either of you thinks about it in that exit polling, but, but it's, it's, it's a critical issue, mm -hmm. a very critical issue. I, I'll mention just one other factor. Uh, recently, my, my spouse, my wife, uh, was having some procedure, and she said to the doctor, you used to do this in your office. And he said, I know. Now we have to go to the hospital to do it. And although her insurance is good and will take care of the, the cost, that's additional cost that's still additional expense on a procedure the doctor said, we did these in our offices for a year. We had no problems, but now some mandate that we have to do them in the hospital. So there's all kinds of issues that both federal and state. Mm -hmm. but, but focusing in for just a moment, because Senator Chase, I'd be interested in your perspective too, uh, on that children's health care part, because I would think that's one that's, I would think is, is a nonpartisan part of the whole issue of the, of the the insurance has been there for children and still waiting to see is the federal government going to fund it and if they don't would it be in the senate budget and the house budget the governor's budget would it be well, i certainly hope so um, and we'll find out with the senate finance committee actually has its retreat this week and um, to show you how well the senate works together all senators are invited to attend that and i i'm pretty certain we'll get some sort of uh, briefing on that. Um, I have heard, uh, again, on both sides of the aisle, both at the federal and the state level, that this is something that, that we're concerned about, um, is making sure that, that, that the sickest children uh, get, the, get the coverage that they need. Right, and um, I would agree with that. You know, something that we should probably talk about is there is a difference between waivers and Medicaid expansion, because we, I know I personally voted in favor of waivers, which um, basically is to help. I mean, we, we have a lot of children with individual intellectual disabilities, um, physical disabilities, and, and that whole process has changed a little bit. And I know that there are some children um, that, that are being dropped. 
And so that's a concern of mine. And so we're going to work together and, and we're going to figure this out before January. But um, I, I'm encouraged that we're having these conversations now. We're going to have a retreat this weekend, Republicans and Democratic senators. I mean, we're, we're going to be on top of this and we're going to make sure that our, our citizens are taken care of. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about some other issues then? <laughs> we don't want our time to all go by and then there's another issue. What other issues for the upcoming session? Well, I just want to continue to foc about, focus on transparency as co-founder of the Transparency Caucus. Um, one, of, one of the main reasons that I ran was to um, allow people to engage their government. You know, it, there used to be a paradigm of you know, those were your representatives, but you didn't really actually talk to them, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm like, how is that representative government when you're not, when you feel like you can't talk to your representatives and your senators? So I've worked really hard to, to change that model, and I've really been um, thankful to see so much support in the Senate, and one of the things that we mentioned as a huge accomplishment of the, the Transparency Caucus was for the first time ever in Virginia's history, those committee meetings will be live streamed. And so that's something that, that we worked on together, both in the House and the Senate, Democrat, Republican, in a bipartisan fashion to improve transparency in the Commonwealth. And those committees is where most of the work mm -hmm. is done. It's not mm -hmm. on the floor of the House or the Senate, which is what is most of the time televised. So um, I think that's a positive direction for the General Assembly. You see more transparency. Um, I think that's a good, a good thing. So that's probably going to be something that I continue to push along with the health care transparency. A couple other issues. Um, we'll continue work on uh, in education on SOL reform. Um, you know, the high school redesign uh, is being implemented. There might be some tweaks to that. Um, the school to prison pipeline is still a huge issue. A new report came out that showed that uh, suspensions and expulsions were still uh, at high rates disproportionately impacting uh, children of color and children with disabilities. Uh, there was legislation last year on that issue that almost passed that I think will be back. Um, and we have to talk about Charlottesville. I think there will be um, on two sides. Um, I think there is a real close look at um, what, uh, what should be the appropriate um, level of open carry or guns and these very highly volatile uh, public protests. Um, and I think we are unfortunately seeing an increase in uh, incidents of, of racism and bullying uh, in our schools and, and in the community. Uh, and I think that they'll, they'll need to be some, some, if not legislation, at least a look at how do we tackle that? Um, because I, that's not acceptable. I mean, what we saw at Short Pump middle school is not acceptable. Um, and there are uh, some, some programs in place to help school, give schools resources they need to sort of teach tolerance or, or address those issues. And we just need to make sure that all our schools are taking advantage of those resources. Um, because we have seen in, in a disturbing uptick in, in whether it's racial or, um, or sexual or just tension and bullying and uh, hatred against people for who they are. And as, as leaders, as a commonwealth, that we can't just let that go, you know, without some response. What about an issue that uh, the U.S. Uh, Senate passed unanimously just this month? And what do you think it's needed in Virginia? And that is, in light of everything that's happening, um, mandatory sexual harassment training. Uh, the Senate is, the U.S. Senate has said that voluntarily, but they passed a resolution saying it's going to be mandatory for all senators and for their staff. Uh, perhaps a good time to consider that in Virginia when there's not a crisis, not a problem. What do you think? I th you know, I think that's something worth looking at, um, not just at the General Assembly, but all state employees. I think we need to take a good look at the training that is done, not only on sexual harassment, but again, implicit bias. Um, which is something that, that at least the, um, the state police had started to look at. And, and if we think that there's a gap in that training, I do think that we need to, to fill that gap. Okay, so here's where I am on this. I feel like it's, it's always a good idea to have more education on these mm -hmm. issues. I mm -hmm. think sometimes um, 
and I'll just say, you know, I, I have experienced some of this um, in, you know, throughout my lifetime, I've experienced some of the bias and that type of thing. And, you know, I've never been one to take on a victim mentality, and I think we don't want to create that. I think education and training is important um, at all levels, um, lobbyists, General Assembly members, um, across the board. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's not going to hurt us. I'm getting the signal that that's a good place to leave it. <laughs> okay. Time has run out. Thank you okay. both very much for being on this week in Richmond. That's Thank great. You. Thanks for having us. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.